Our next speaker is Dr. Peter J. Williams, who is the warden of Tyndale House in Cambridge. Tyndale House is the research arm of UCCF, and it's a centre of expertise for the study of the Bible. Dr. Williams was a lecturer in Old Testament in Cambridge before moving to become senior lecturer in New Testament um, at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, uh, showing the breadth of his expertise. In July 2007, he became warden of Tyndale House in Cambridge, and he continues as honorary senior lecturer in biblical studies at the University of Aberdeen. On Dr. Williams' appointment as um, warden of Tyndale House, Professor Don Carson noted that not many scholars can speak competently across as many technical fields as can Pete. And having heard him speak, uh, I'd fully endorse that. Under his leadership, Tyndale House's current Bible and Church project has been presenting world-class scholarship directly to the church, providing Christians with evidence in support of the historical basis of our faith, renewing confidence in the Bible. Some of you may have been at their conference here two years ago, and there are DVDs from that, and this one, The Authentic Gospels, New Evidence. There are very few copies of this left. They're available on the UCCS stand uh, over on your left. So do get there quickly uh, and pick those up. They're well worth viewing. A number of you will be aware of the controversy over the Canaanites that uh, Richard Dawkins has raised over this last week. Uh, and so uh, having had this planned for some time before that, it's particularly relevant um, to have Dr. Peter Williams speak to us now on the Old Testament and the New Atheists. Please welcome him. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be here as the junior member of the quartet today and uh, to have a chance to uh, share with you about this topic uh, and everything's ready to go. The New Atheists and the Old Testament is my topic. I'm not as philosophically sophisticated as uh, the other speakers today, so I may make some blunders, but they can correct that in a question session later. I wanted to say a little bit about arguments. Basically, at this point, I'm responding to an objection to the Old Testament. Now, if Christianity is true, we should expect there to be positive arguments for Christianity. We should also expect the arguments against Christianity not to be um, defeaters. So I'm not expecting you to go away with a great sense of, wow, haven't we got a great argument about the Canaanites here, so much as, well, that objection <coughs> that God commands the destruction of the Canaanites in the Old Testament isn't as bad an objection as I thought it was. When people ask us questions, I think sometimes we can ask them to rank their questions. They seem to have an infinite list of questions, and I'd like to say, is that your most difficult question? Is that your most important question? And if they say, well, yes, that is my most difficult question, you say, well, are you then prepared to admit that if your most difficult question could be answered or part answered, then the other questions can also be dealt with. That seems a reasonable inference. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the general narrative that we have of religion and violence in our culture, morality and the nature of the universe, and then finally look at the Old Testament story of the destruction of the Canaanites. Well, just uh, on Thursday, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins put up uh, on the uh, Guardian online uh, his newest reason for not debating uh, William Lane Craig, which is uh, that uh, he's an apologist for genocide because uh, Bill Craig has spoken uh, about uh, the um, Old Testament and argued that um, what God commanded was not necessarily unjustified. It fits into a wider narrative that we have in our culture about religion and violence. The secularists have been telling us a story that says, well, we can go back to the Crusades, you can go to the European wars of religion, you can go to the witch hunts, you can go to all sorts of things. Religious people are violent. And then we have 9-11, and that narrative only intensifies. Religion causes violence. We might well ask, is that really reasonable? Well, of course, it is, in part, true. There are religious systems which cause violence. They have that built into themselves. However, in one sense, it shows too much, because we could also say that politics causes violence. After all, we can see all sorts of examples where politics 
has resulted in violence. Does that mean all politics is bad? Well, maybe some people today would say yes. But what about leadership causes violence? Can't we say that there are all sorts of instances of violence that have happened in history because there has been leadership? So what we need to do is have no leadership. Well, you know that if there's no leadership, it's going to be even more violent. So actually, we can't just say uh, that because one thing has caused some violence, uh, that that thing is necessarily bad, because we know that one of these things, like politics and leadership, in itself can be neutral. What about thinking causes violence? I mean, where have we ever had violence where people have not been thinking? Cognition. Essential for violence. And, and so, does that mean cognition is a bad thing? Well, I think that's what people like to do with this religion causes violence, but it's a very important narrative in the culture because actually it means that when they see one more example, it fits into a pre-existent story and that gives it plausibility because stories are what often convince people that things are true. Now, of course, you could look at people like Mao and Stalin and think, well, didn't they cause quite a bit of violence between them? Was it 80 million or something? Uh, the numbers vary depending what you read. And someone might say, well, haven't those two atheists, people who thought religion was something they wanted to get rid of, uh, killed more people than all the people killed during all the wars of religion in all of history? Ah, says the atheist. No. Uh, the, the problem is, that was just two people, and I'm not that kind of atheist. Fine. But then I want to say, well, I'm not that kind of Christian. I mean, if you, if you want to say, I'm a follower of Jesus, and you want to, you know, load on me everything that has ever been done wrong in the name of Jesus, is that really fair? We could also think about what about great thinkers or uh, thinkers of the past, and can we blame them for everything that's done in their name? Let's take Karl Marx. Well, of course, your Marxist, Marxists want to say, well, you know, he had some great thoughts, and people took them in the wrong direction. What about Charles Darwin? You know, can we blame him for the Holocaust? Well, no, people would say, no, he had some great thoughts and people took them in the wrong direction. But the same would also apply to Buddha, wouldn't it? Can you blame Buddha, if he existed, for all the, you know, anything done wrong in the name of Buddhism? But of course, the same has to apply to Jesus Christ. Can we object to Jesus Christ because of things done in the name of Jesus Christ? And it seems pretty obvious to me that we can't. So I think I would be very generous in proposing a Marxist Christian truce, you know? Uh, and we basically say, okay, I'm not gonna um, uh, do down Karl Marx because of what was done in his name, provided you don't do down Jesus Christ because of what is done in his name. I want you to look at Jesus Christ and I want you to tell me about Karl Marx. Seems like a fair deal. Now getting on to the Old Testament, we remember this, uh, quotation many of us from Richard Dawkins after he's been consulting uh, a, a thesaurus. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, and infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> Notice the scansion at the end. So there we have his view of the God of the Old Testament. Well, I wonder how much he's actually been reading. Or well, here we have uh, from Christopher Hitchens, from God is not great, how religion po poisons everything. Um, <clears throat> the Bible may indeed does contain a warrant for trafficking in humans, for ethnic cleansing, for slavery, for bribe price, and for indiscriminate massacre. So that's what they believe the Old Testament is teaching. The objections uh, can be, of course, about violence generally in the Old Testament, reporting of war and conflict. But we can always say, well, that's just reporting, it's not commending. People might also object to the Old Testament laws uh, that have uh, capital punishment and uh, corporal punishment and so on, and we can raise that in question time if you like. Some people make objections about slavery. But I think the most uh, important objection, the one that comes up the most, is that God in the Old Testament told his people Israel to destroy the Canaanites. We can deal with the Amalekites separately if you like. We'll just focus on the Canaanites this time. 
And the objection might go like this. How can a God of love command the destruction of seven nations? What about the children? Isn't that genocide? And if your God could command them back then to kill people, couldn't he command you? And isn't that just like the, the terrorists, suicide bombers and so on? That's the form of the objection. Now, of course, post 9-11, I think a lot of us would feel quite a bit of weight to that last uh, um, way of putting the objection. So what we have is uh, atheists often making an alignment between the Old Testament and two very nasty things. One is religious terrorism, 9-11, etc. And the other thing is genocide, Rwanda, and what went on there. And in a sense, all of the nasty things of those two separate nasty things bundled together in one is the Old Testament. Well, before getting on to that, I want us to consider something about um, moral judgments. It's already been very well put uh, earlier today how there can be no morality outside of, of God, no objective moral values, no moral imperatives. But let's assume that um, we're not going to try to press that argument too far. What can we say about morality? Well, our moral intuitions are formed in part by the nature of the universe we're in. Take, for instance, the universe of Tom and Jerry. Now, for those of you who are familiar with this, different physical laws apply in this universe. It's possible for um, Jerry um, to uh, do something very nasty to Tom. Tom will be uh, elongated or um, compressed, and very soon uh, he will be restored to his original setting. And that means that when we have our children watching Tom and Jerry, we might have some qualms of conscience about it, but on the whole, we realise that our children are going to be discerning and realise that different physical laws apply in the Tom and Jerry universe to their own. And so, therefore, they will not take this as uh, simply a licence to do what they will and have no consequences. Or you could imagine uh, the story of uh, the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice here in a Disney version. Um, and, and what happens is every time, of course, uh, the apprentice uh, chops up one of those um, uh, brooms, it becomes two. Now, what does that teach us? Well, when, it, when we think about why it's bad to hit someone, the reason it's bad to hit someone actually is connected to something about the universe, namely the pain that they will feel. If you're in a universe in which there was no pain, it would not be of the same order. Or what about killing someone? If every time you killed someone, two of them came back, it would fundamentally change the nature of killing some, would it, would it not? Or you could think about a film like Prince of Persia, where, of course, time can run backwards. And that, of course, fundamentally changes the nature of killing someone. But we have to say that actually Christians and atheists disagree fundamentally about the nature of the universe, and that sometimes has game-changing uh, effects on uh, morality. For instance, is the fact that Christians believe that there is something after death, isn't that a pretty fundamental thing? Does that not change the nature of the universe you're in relative to an atheistic universe? Does that not have some effect on morality? Or the Christian belief that God himself became incarnate and suffered on earth, does that not have a game-changing effect on morality? I believe that it does. So when we read a story like in Genesis 22 about Abraham offering up his son Isaac, it is essential that we read this in the right moral universe. Now the tendency, of course, is for an atheist just simply to read um, God, nasty him, told Abraham to offer up his son Isaac. Well, God tells someone to kill someone else, that's bad, and they draw a simple parallel with 9-11. But actually, when we read the story of Abraham, going from the beginning, we read that God has been very faithful to Abraham over many years, has shown himself capable of fulfilling impossible promises to Abraham, and he has made a promise that Isaac is going to have children. That absolutely has to be fulfilled because God has promised it. But hang on, Isaac hasn't yet had any children. That means that Abraham knows, because he knows that God is reliable, that God is going to have to do something remarkable, uh, which um, is, is to do with the nature of the universe, in order to make sure that if he does kill Isaac, Isaac can continue to exist to have children. 
And so when we read in Genesis 22 that he goes along with his two servants to the mountain with Isaac, he says to the two servants that he leaves at the bottom of the mountain, I and the lad are going to come back. Now that is a game-changing thing because it shows actually the nature of the universe that Abraham believes he's in. As the New Testament comments, he believed that God was able to raise him from the dead. Now, does such a thing affect the universe, uh, affect morality? I believe, in fact, it does. And that's going to come to be important in what we look to. Now, what is the right thing to do? I believe the right thing to do is what God commands. And you might think, well, doesn't that mean God can command you to do the most nasty thing and it's the right thing to do? Absolutely not. Because God cannot command you to do absolutely anything any more than God can do absolutely anything. The Bible says that God cannot lie. God cannot create another God greater than himself, apart from the fact that it would be logically impossible. He can't make himself cease to exist. There is, in fact, an infinite number of things that at least we could say that God cannot do. Uh, God cannot make three gods, four gods, five gods, uh, you know, greater than himself. Not that those are logically possible anyway. But, you know, the, the point is, uh, all sorts of things that we could maybe talk about, uh, he can't do. And God cannot lie. God, I don't think, can command us to lie. But there are some things which would be wrong for you to do on your own authority, but would be right if he gave you the authority. And that's where we realise that um, uh, making that distinction uh, again between objective and absolute morality that was made uh, by Bill uh, Craig earlier, that of course there are things which um, you, you cannot do in any but the most exceptional circumstances, and one of them is kill another human being. But in certain circumstances, you can be authorised to do that. Now, of course, unqualified, that sounds like a really risky statement. It sounds like it's just licence for anything. God can uh, declare wrong, right, and right, wrong. No, that's not what we're saying. Because for Christians, when we believe this, when we believe in what's called di divine command theory, namely that what God commands is right, that is always in the context of the character of God proven and shown in Scripture. God reveals himself to be merciful. That's something we know. He's trustworthy. God gives him a record of his gracious actions in the Old Testament. He has proven character, and that means we can trust him. And you cannot divorce one bit of Christian teaching, namely that we should do what God commands, from this, the fact that God is shown to be trustworthy as we look at the narrative of the Old Testament. It's not that God goes round regularly giving commands like he did to Abraham. Uh, that command, in its own way, is unique. Someone might say, well, isn't it always wrong to kill an innocent person? Isn't it always morally wrong? Well, of course, it's not always that moral guilt is incurred for killing someone else. I mean, what if someone is killed by a machine or killed by an animal like a tiger? Well, that tiger doesn't incur moral guilt. If someone is, uh, who kills by accident does not incur guilt in the same way, or someone who's mentally ill, we might debate the particular circumstances, but they cannot be said to be guilty in the same way as someone who's not. What about someone who sincerely believes that they're authorised to kill someone? Are they allowed to kill someone? The answer is absolutely not. It's nothing at all to do with sincerity. If you sincerely believe that you have voices in your head going to, uh, telling you to go and kill someone, like the Yorkshire Ripper uh, did, that gives you no authorisation whatsoever. But that if you indeed have proper authorisation, things are different. Think about 9-11. There was, of course, that uh, jet which uh, never made it to uh, the target that the um, uh, terrorists were aiming for and which came down over Pennsylvania. When it was known about that jet, of course, uh, there was an executive uh, order to scramble jets and to, to ask them to intercept um, uh, planes, to uh, talk to them if they didn't respond in the right way, to shoot them down. Now, is that morally right or wrong? At least I would say it's not obviously morally wrong. I mean, we can have a discussion about it, but it's not obvious that that's morally wrong. So, in fact, in extreme circumstances, with due authorization, I think one could say that perhaps uh, a pilot in a jet would be um, authorized to do something which would take innocent life. Now, that 
is absolutely exceptional. And I want to make the same case about the Old Testament, that what we see when we come to the destruction of the Canaanites in the Old Testament is something as exceptional as that other thing that happened on 9-11, which the new atheists don't often talk about. Well, let's think about the way the new atheists tend to attack the Old Testament. I would maintain that they do something very unfair, which is they launch two simultaneous attacks on the Old Testament. The first attack is, it didn't happen, Dawkins' fiction word, and the second thing is, it's unfair. Now, if we're going to look at the fairness of something, it doesn't matter whether it happened or not. We look at the fairness of the story. We could look at that in Tom and Jerry's world, we could look at it uh, in any story, whether something is fair or not. But if I'm going to judge the fairness of the story, I think it's only fair to look at the story world that I'm looking at. I cannot judge the morality of Jerry's actions against Tom thinking of our physical laws. That's not actually entering properly into understanding the story. So I believe that in order for an atheist to critique the morality of the story in the Old Testament, they have to enter into that story. Now this is what Dawkins says in The God Delusion. The ethnic cleansing begun in the time of Moses is brought to bloody fruition in the book of Joshua, a, rem a text remarkable for the bloodthirsty massacres it records and the xenophobic relish with which it does so. Yet again, theologians will protest it didn't happen. Indeed, it didn't happen. But that's not the point. The point is that whether true or not, the Bible is held up to us as the source of our morality. Well, I, at one level, I might say, yes, it doesn't matter whether it happened or not, but I would say, if we're going to consider the story, we have to consider all of the details in the story, including all of the characters in the story, and one of them, by the way, is called God. He's a character in the story. And I can't just say, well, I don't believe in God, so as I'm judging the story, I sort of omit him from the story. That's not fair. Or as, again, we have uh, the way Dawkins talks about uh, Joshua. The Bible story of Joshua's destruction of Jericho and the invasion of the Promised Land in general is morally indistinguishable from Hitler's invasion of Poland or Saddam Hussein's massacres of the Kurds and the Marsh Arabs. Or as he said uh, just on Thursday, most churchmen these days widely disown the horrific genocides ordered by the God of the Old Testament. Anyone who criticises the divine bloodlust is loudly accused of unfairly ignoring the historical context or of naive literalism towards what was never more than metaphor or myth. I would say he's got it exactly wrong there. He says that uh, the, the tendency is for people to say, aha, uh -huh, it's not really meant to be taken so seriously. My problem is that he doesn't take the text seriously enough including all of the details in it, as I will seek to show. Because when Dawkins tells the story, it goes like this. God doesn't speak to anyone, no miracles are performed, there's no massive exodus, but then I can judge all of the characters as if God hadn't actually told them to do anything. So in other words, he's got his own naturalistic, watered-down version of exodus, and that's the thing that he attacks. What's the reality? When we look at the story in the Old Testament, firstly, we have to go back to the beginning. And to understand God, we have to understand what he set up in the beginning. In the beginning, God gave everyone life. That's part of the story. I can't just miss that out. It's actually there. I could also say that God clearly doesn't think violence is good because in the beginning, there was none. When I look at the end of his story in the Old Testament, as outlined in the prophets, I can see again his vision of peace, that the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and so on. So that gives me some guidance as to how to understand the story. Trying to understand a bit of a story without reading the beginning and the end usually isn't the best way before you write your literary criticism. Then we need to get into the story about the Canaanites. What's in the story? Well, one of the things is that in the story, they're punished for their wickedness, not for their race. This isn't a racist question. How can we show that? Because Rahab, the prostitute, and her extended family were spared. And why was she spared? Because she wanted to believe in God. Why did she want to believe in God? Because she had heard about him. And in fact, she said that all of the people around her had heard about the amazing things he had done, and yet she was the only one who seemed to respond. And yet, in the story, when Israel commits the same sins as the Canaanites, they too are judged like the Canaanites. So it's not a question of favouring one race over another. According to the story, according to what Rahab and others indicate, the people in the land knew what God could do and chose to resist. 
Also in the story, they sacrificed their children. This is something that also, we can say, uh, seems very uh, likely archaeologically. People believe that they did have child sacrifice at the time. This is um, from Phoenician culture, where you've got uh, their uh, baby being uh, offered in sacrifice to a two-headed um, god. But um, Phoenician and Canaanite culture are deeply linked. And it says in Deuteronomy, for every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they've done uh, for their gods. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Then we need to think about Israel within the story. Within the story, Israel has a unique relationship to God. Israel is his judicial representative. That means, of course, that no one can correctly apply anything that Israel is told to do by God directly to themselves. We can also say <coughs> that an important part of the story is the miracles. The command to destroy the Canaanites was accompanied by the greatest display of miracles that really is recorded in the Old Testament. You have the Exodus and the Ten Plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, and then God going with a pillar of cloud and fire for 40 years in the desert. Well, you may believe that's just myth and didn't happen, but the point is, in the story, that's an integral part, and that means I can't just count that out. And that means, of course, when I look at it from the point of view of the characters in the story, the Israelites, then they would have had no reason to doubt God's command. If he's really given the command, uh, the Ten Commandments, booming voice from the top of a mountain to a whole crowd below, and clearly um, uh, authenticated Moses, they would have no reason to doubt it. So if I'm looking at the morality of, let's say, Odysseus in the Odyssey, I need to consider him in the light of the Odyssey's claim that Athena appeared to him. Whether it's fiction or history, doesn't make any difference. The point is I can't just discount that, that's all part of the story. So if I'm going to judge the morality of the people in the story, I have to say, well, would they really have had any choice about what they could do if God really had done all those miracles? We could also consider some of the principles of the story. God saying that uh, uh, punishment should be limited by proportionality. The unusual thing that the warfare and the conquest of Canaan is, uh, shows a restraint that is not found elsewhere. If you were being besieged by the Assyrians, <clears throat> you weren't just worried that they would kill you, you were worried about what they might do with you before they killed you. And yet one of the things that doesn't happen, if you like the dog that doesn't bark, uh, and it didn't bark, uh, in the story of uh, the invasion of Canaan is them going in and torturing all of the people and then killing them. It's just not there. We can also say, and this isn't an argument that the Bible used, but I throw it out in case it's useful to you, that it would have put an end to Canaanite child sacrifice. Could an omniscient God know that over the centuries this command might result in the killing of fewer children? whereas not giving the command would have led to a cycle of violence as one generation avenged the next and so on. We can't say for definite, but I, I suppose we can always ask, say that the, it's the burden of proof on someone to prove that an omniscient God could not have known that. Then we need to think about the character of God. When God reveals himself in this context, he reveals something about his personality. He says, I am the God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. In other words, if you like, there is an asymmetry in which God's um, tendency towards mercy is different from the way he has a tendency towards anger. Because the anger is, if you like, a strange work to God, not something inherent uh, to him, whereas his love is something. And we see that in the story where, of course, God delayed the punishment of the Amorites, one of those groups of the Canaanites, uh, for 400 years. Well, think how many conflicts nowadays would be avoided if people just waited 400 years before pulling the trigger. It would make quite a difference, wouldn't it? So those are all part of the story. We can also say that in the story, God actually did most of the fighting. I mean, God made the walls of Jericho fall down, and when the Israelites went into the land and they fought with the northern um, uh, coalition of kings, it actually says in the text that God, through the hail, killed more people than the Israelites did. Now, I can't just strip that out because God is actually the biggest character in the narrative. And I'd want to suggest to you that that's a game-changing thing. Imagine that Neptune appears out of the sea. You know, really? Uh, to someone and tells them to go and do something. 
Are you going to hold that person responsible for what they do in the same way as if he hadn't? No, no, no that, that really does make a difference. And then the question is, how are you going to complain to Neptune about what he's doing? But then let's blow this up to something bigger. What if we're talking about Almighty God? What if he made everything and commanded this? Doesn't that make a difference? Whether in reality or in fiction, I'd say it does make a difference. Now, someone might say, well, that's just the way the Bible justifies it. They might say, well, don't a lot of nations claim to be better than other nations? In fact, Israel uh, in the Bible is not said to be better. I know of no ancient literature which so much does down the nation from which the literature came as the Old Testament. You know, usually ancient literature doesn't just say the glories of, of, of uh, the people group, it actually tends to give you the glories of their kings, which also you don't get much of in the Old Testament, do you? The, the, the Old Testament tells you, in fact, that Israel became as bad as the other nations. You can compare the most proverbially evil uh, city, Sodom, in Genesis chapter 19 and what goes on there, with, in fact, what happens in the city of Israel in Judges chapter 19. You can read about Manasseh and how he burnt his sons, and, as it says, has done more evil than all the Amorites did who were before him. So does the Bible encourage people to kill others today? Absolutely not, because as we read it, we know we don't have the same judicial position as Israel had then. The command was not private, but with the greatest display of signs of all history. So you can't say that someone like the Yorkshire Ripper or some 9-11 terrorists who made some deductions because of things going on in their head uh, that they should kill someone is any, in any way parallel with someone who has actually heard God's voice uh, speak from heaven when there are 603,550 men listening. It's quite a different thing. So it's completely different from all modern wars and I think intelligent readers know that. Children know that. They feel that in their intuition test, which by the way explains Richard Dawkins' um, experiment with children and why they don't seem to object to the Joshua narrative. So a common atheist perspective is that religious terrorism and genocide go together. Dawkins in particular says that Joshua, uh, the narrative there, is morally indistinguishable from the story about Hitler or Saddam Hussein. Well, I'd want to say there are a number of differences. The specific guilt. The narrative in Joshua really does have sin on the part of the Canaanites. It's not indiscriminate. And in fact, there's even a concern for children there. There's a 400 year delay. There's a warning which is ignored. There's warrant on the behalf of the people who are actually executing the command. And God does most of the fighting. Does that really make no difference morally between two things? I'd want to say, actually, those sort of things can make a world of difference. You might think that two things look the same when they're quite different. Take an amputation. An amputation you know, cutting off a limb by a surgeon to help someone is absolutely morally worlds apart from an amputation in a, a bloodbath in Sierra Leone. You can't say that they're the same thing. Of course, you can go very superficially and say, well, you know, in each case, an arm was cut off by a person using something with a sharp edge. And you say, well, therefore, they're morally the same. But actually, the conditions make them morally worlds apart. Then we need to ask, which objection are people making? There are two very different objections. One is the objection, it was immoral for God to command the destruction of the Canaanites. The other one, it's immoral for the Israelites to obey such a command if it really was given in the way the Bible describes. Now, I would have thought that it's very hard actually to make that second objection. Because the second objection would mean if I were on a jury judging those people and God really had appeared to them and given them a command in that way, I would judge them to be guilty. Would you? Would there be no special plea circumstances related to that if that really did happen? And then the first objection is even more difficult. Because if God really did make the world and really gave everyone life, who are you to say that he can't do something? But when we come to this, what we find is, in fact, there is an emotional reaction for us, and that's a good emotional reaction. The emotional reaction is, this all feels wrong. And it does, because we're in a broken 
universe. I'm not want wanting to say that the problem is taken away. I'm not wanting to say that all the questions are answered. But this is clearly the most difficult moral objection to the Bible, at least at an emotional level. But if we consider the fullness of the story, we have to consider who God is and the reality of the command. We can't strip that out. Then, of course, we realize that it's not a conclusive defeater. When we look at it uh, in an analytical way, it's not a defeater. That doesn't necessarily give us more rest in our souls. What would, I think, give us more rest in our souls is contemplation of the cross. And arguably, we could say that if the destruction of the Canaanites is the punishment for their sins, then that's what sin deserved. And if Christ on the cross took our sins on himself, then what happened to the Canaanites becomes for some way a picture for us of how awful sin is and how much Jesus Christ did on the cross for us, taking on himself, that one person, the punishment for so many. And when we look at that it, like that, I think it's much more emotionally and spiritually satisfying. If we can say this about the most difficult moral objection to the Old Testament, I think that should make us want to consider the positive arguments for Christianity, at least with an open mind. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter, very much for that. It gave us a very different way of looking at to what is, for many of us, I think, a really difficult uh, issue uh, to think about. So uh, I'm sure there are questions. So if you want to make your way up to each of the microphones, uh, and then we'll take about 10 minutes of questions from you. OK, on the right first, thank you. Hello, thank you for your talk. I found it really helpful. I've been asked about the Canaanite genocide from quite a lot of my non-Christian friends and I, I've spoken about it quite a few times but they usually don't give me 45 minutes to explain and so I was wondering if you could help me what points would you raise if you had five minutes or you were writing on a blog or something like that? Yeah, great question. I mean, part of the issue is, is uh, you know, the soundbite culture that we're in so I think what you need to do is try and reply with something that might stop someone uh, in, in their tracks. Um, and so, uh, could you reply, you know, are you, could you imagine another universe in which the morality would be different? Because, I mean, they're thinking uh, within a, you know, uh, you know one, one conception. Um, if they're an atheist, we might want to ask why they have this moral intuition that this is wrong. So, I mean, that, that to me would, might be a classic way to go. You feel this is so wrong, where do you get that sense? of it being wrong, um, you know, because what if you were to sort of swap roles and start saying, well, I don't think it's wrong at all. We want to affirm their sense that there is uh, something that's objectively wrong um, uh, in, in, you know, in all but special circumstances of, of, of killing someone. We might want to ask them to think whether there can be special circumstances, because we're very much wanting to say, look, this thing that happened with the Canaanites is not normal. This is exceptional. It's not normal way of carrying out wars in the Old Testament. It's, it's a special circumstance. So I think I'd want to do something like that, just, um, just a little teaser that, that gets um, the door slightly open, maybe. And a question from the other side. Um, yeah, so when we take into account the fact that in the Old Testament people were stoned and people were like, if you went to war you could take a wife home or something, stuff like yep. that, yep. like all that stuff. And then we, like you said, we look at the cross though and we say, um, you know, that shows, that shows how serious sin was mm -hmm. and, you know, like Jesus had to die for us. But that doesn't take away the fact that, like, was it fair for the other people back in the day yeah. to have to endure that suffering when we get what makes it so special for us now yeah well of course thank you there are a couple of sorts of, un, of uh, unfairness one is negative unfairness and one is a positive unfairness and the positive unfairness is of course you know the people who work in the field all day and uh, you know the people who've been working there all day get um, the uh, pay they agree to and the ones who just work for a short time get something extra so in a, in a sense I'd want to know 
what we're looking at there. When I understand the Old Testament, I want to do what Jesus does uh, when he's asked about divorce. Matthew 19, he says, when you look at the law of Moses, you've got to remember that's not the way it was in the beginning. In the beginning, there was no divorce. I can do the same with slavery. I can look at something and say, look, in the beginning, there was no um, one person ruling over another in that sort of way. I can do the same with polygamy, multiple wives. That's not there in the beginning. And whenever people have multiple wives, there are always family problems. You know, so I can go back to the beginning and I think I'd want to do the same uh, in relation to anything to do with violence, I want to say, look, God's pattern at the beginning is that there should be um, no violence. Then I come to commands like about stoning and so on. Well, I think we do have capital punishment in our society. Um, if you um, carry a large rucksack, jump over security barriers at an airport and run towards a plane, um, you know, and you get shot, well, you know, you think, well, all you've done is jumped over some barriers carrying a rucksack running towards a plane. I mean, what's wrong with that? I mean, running, carrying a rucksack, what's wrong with those? You know, but we know there's a certain context for that. Uh, and that might help us uh, understand some of these things. With, um, the other thing is, prison that we have, you can only have when you have an economic surplus. So, you know, to, to say that a society long ago should have been using prisons, prisons have problems, you know, it doesn't really work. Um, that would at least explain some of the corporal punishments. You never have corporal punishments for non-corporal offences. That's the other thing. I mean, you hit someone's eye, that's what you get back to yourself. Um, so I would want to bring in a number of things, but what I think is going on in the Old Testament legislation is regulation some of the time. If the government regulates the gambling industry and decides not to shut everything down, does that mean they think gambling's a good thing. No, it means that it's being tolerated at a certain level. And I think what we have sometimes in the Old Testament is that sort of regulation and toleration. The case of people uh, take, being allowed, for instance, to take wives uh, that have, from a defeated army uh, in war is actually very unusual because, of course, didn't all ancient societies involve in battlefield rape? We actually have a command against battlefield rape. You have to wait one month before you take her. Now, you might think that's not very long, but in the society, it's actually a huge step from what normally went on. So I think I'd want to say we've got movement towards the right, uh, in, in the right direction. Why wasn't it stricter? Well, uh, because I guess um, humans are so sinful. Um, God knows what reactions there would be if um, th his law uh, had been, you know, uh, stricter. I'm not always as strict with my children as I think I might need to be because I, I am also trying to move them on. Does that help? Thank you. From the right. Yes, you kind of touched on this, but if you can expand a little bit. Um, regarding the slavery question and Exodus 21 20, I think, <coughs> yeah. talks about the beating. Yeah. and about the property yeah. and I don't really understand why God who knew right from wrong wasn't able to do more to ensure that that kind of thing didn't happen and at what point suddenly it was bad. Okay, um, on the subject of slavery I think I'd want to distinguish a number of different sorts of slavery depending actually on the origins of um, the uh, slavery. So if we're thinking about someone being owned by someone else is it that they've sold themselves um, into this position, that they've been conquered, uh, that they have been born into this position, that they have been kidnapped into this position, or that they got into debt and are therefore in that position? Then we need to think, um, when we have... Uh, th those are all very different circumstances. I have far less sympathy for someone who gets themselves into that situation through open-eyed choice, you know. Um, then we need to think, when we read the Old Testament, Roman slavery and the North Atlantic slave trade had not happened. So we mustn't read the word slave back in there. Uh, actually, the King James Version only has the word slave once in the Old Testament, and that's in italics because it's not there in the original. And there's been a rise in the occurrence of the word slave um, in Old Testament translations, which I'm having a little fight against. But that's uh, another story. Um, so I'd want to say, let's at least park the term, look at the reality. The reality is when we read about these servants, whether it's of Abraham or whatever, these are people who are trusted with wealth and so on. In the Old Testament, if you knock the tooth out of your servant, then uh, you have to let them go free. 
But what was allowed in the Old Testament was what we might now call debt slavery. And this is where, again, you're in a subsistence society. You've run out of everything that you have. Are you allowed to sell yourself? Or what that means is effectively hold yourself as you know, um, capital against a, an advance. And that, I think, uh, is allowed. And in a sense, in a subsistence society, it's that if you have no so social welfare or death. And that is a different thing. And I think we read the word slave and we think slave catchers, there are no traders in slaves that we read about in the Old Testament apart from Joseph's brothers, and that was a very bad idea. Um, it's people selling themselves or their daughters, but then all marriages are financial transactions. I can explain that if you like. Um, it's a different thing that's going on. So um, the verse that I think you referred to was uh, Exodus chapter 20, uh, was it? Or 21, yeah, sorry, 21 verse 20, uh, where he said, okay, um, uh, if a man strikes his servant or slave or his maidservant with a, a rod and he, they die under his hand, he shall be avenged. Now, what does that mean? It means that there is capital punishment, I would assume, if you kill your own servant or slave. Now, I think that is quite a striking thing because I don't know that existing anywhere in the ancient world. Um, then, but if it, the person lives for a day or two, he shall not be avenged because... And a lot of translations say at this point, this is 20, uh, Exodus 21, 21, he is his property. Now, literally, it says he's his silver. Now, I think what this means is that this person has made a financial investment in purchasing that man's uh, labor. Uh, and therefore, there's a presumption that if this person just happened to die a few days later, this was not deliberate because this person would be doing himself out of uh, work and... Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So I would not understand this as saying it's his property. Uh, he has, you know, chattel property. I don't, I don't think the Old, the Old Testament is very clear in the book of Job, for instance, that God owns everyone and, you know, that, that has to underlie any of this. Does that help? Okay, I think we need to um, be, perhaps just have one question, if it can be fairly brief and the answer fairly brief as well, Try. I'm afraid. I know it's a really complex issue and it, uh, brief answers don't come easily. Yeah. Just one more, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when we were talking about defending the character of God and you were drawing on the illustration in Deuteronomy with um, Abraham sacrificing his son, um, child sacrifice seemed to be framed as immoral and then Abraham is asked by God to sacrifice his son and you... So is it fair to say that God sometimes asks us to do something evil, even though, like you mentioned, that, some, that Abraham knew full well that he anticipated God stopping him, but is it fair to say that God would ask us to do something evil? Uh, no, I don't think God would ever ask you to do something evil. I would say uh, that there are some things that would be evil to do if you were not properly authorized by God. So the taking of life in special circumstances is not an evil. I mean in special circumstances, like if you're a, 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 an authorized judge, you haven't, or in, in a war, these are special circumstances, it's not an evil. So uh, taking life without due authority is an evil. Um, God isn't interested in having children sacrificed to him, and it's quite clear, you know, he calls it off. The, the test is, he, it says, he's tested Abraham, he wants to see his full obedience. But he only does that against the backdrop of having promised him that um, Isaac will have continued existence and offspring. So in other words, that is, uh, he, he doesn't just go around giving people arbitrary commands. Part of his character is he shows his faithfulness and gives the test in that context. So I think there are sometimes, um, someone might ask you to do something un unreasonable, uh, well, but your judgment of whether it's reasonable depends on your knowledge of them. If they're a random person in the street, you say no. If it's someone you really know and love uh, who, who asks you suddenly to hold a baby for five minutes, then you do it. You know. So I, th I think I'd want to put that context on it. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Shall we show our appreciation once again for... <laughs> Let's go to the source that critics accept most of all in the New Testament. 
I'm going to start chalking off a timeline up here. So this is approximately 30 AD. In the mid-70s, if you found someone in a well-placed book, if that person said Jesus was raised from the dead, you almost could not find one that was not an evangelical. Today, the majority of scholars writing in the field, no matter how far left or right they are, the majority of them think something happened to Jesus after his death. Something happened to him not just to the disciples. I'm gonna argue that you can use a critical approach to the New Testament and still come away believing the resurrection.